What's going on, Total Human Optimizers? We are here today with some very important shit for optimizing your humanity. So listen up, everybody. We're here with Kelly Starrett, the probably the most well-known mobility dude in the world. He's got a podcast. He's got a variety of different channels where it all points to mobility wad and work with a variety of athletes. And he's here to come on. We're going to talk some shit. We're going to figure some stuff out. We're going to help you get loose. What's going on, Kelly? Welcome to the show. Hey, man. Thanks for having me, you guys. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. So takes a little bit to, you know, to your background. You weren't always Mr. Mobility Wad. You know, you were figuring some stuff out. You were learning along the way, I'm sure. So, uh, you know, what, what brought you to here? It's, it's funny you mentioned this. This is a conversation that has sort of come up a lot more for us of late. We, people ask us this, this is kind of a, a familiar meme. And, uh, you know, how, how did you come to understand? Well, we fell down the same rabbit hole that everyone else fell down. We were professional athletes, my wife and I, um, I was on the national team in whitewater kayaking, an obscure sport where there's no money, which is great. <laughs> and, uh, and what I got out of that was a numb hand and not being able to turn my neck for about three months. And what I had done basically like everyone else, I paddled 300 days a year, sometimes twice a day, and I ended up with just a horrific overuse problem. And all the symptoms were there you know, beforehand. My hand was getting weak. It would pump out. I would lose my grip sometimes. I mean, it did that for months. My body was throwing up red flags for months. And then finally, one day, during a, you know, right before team trials, it got really, really bad because we were just, you know, the, the amount of volume we were doing. And uh, you know, I, I, I had to stop. And when I went down the sports medicine rabbit hole, you know, they were not surprised. In fact, all the national team coaches were not surprised. In fact, all the all the the masters in the sport, all the old guys were like, "Oh yeah, this always happens." And I was like, "You mean you knew this was going to happen? <laughs> like, you, what the hell is that?" And uh, that really is how I, you know I got here, and I started refocusing on sort of extreme paddling, which is my background, sort of the class five chasing the gnar with my friends, and. Um, you know, I uh, met my wife in Chile in 2000 and moved to San Francisco from Durango, which was one of the centers for excellence. And I was out surfing at Ocean Beach and I had a moment of Satori and realized I felt like, you know, I could, I could change all this or I could have some insight based on my own experience and my interests. And I decided to go to physical therapy school because I thought that would be the, the fast track. And then uh, lo and behold, we ended up here, you know, and I would be remiss if I didn't say, hey, you know, I discovered CrossFit, the early CrossFit with Greg Glassman, the first mm -hmm. one, like my first semester of PT school. And back then, Greg was posting every single day on a blog about what he was thinking, about training, about what he was, problems he was seeing. It was like, it was the most progressive thinking around strength and conditioning I've ever seen. At the same time, you know, I went to physio school, I found that I didn't understand gymnastics, I didn't understand Olympic lifting. I didn't understand powerlifting, wasn't very fit, and I just had these big holes, and I was recognizing that if I went after performance, then I got injured prevention in the bargain, specifically yeah. because my mechanics improved. And then I figured out later on that if I taught perfect mechanics and used it as a drill and skill and diagnostic tool, then when people were fighting or doing anything in their sport, we could end up with much better positions and more importantly, understand what was going on. So fast forward, you know, 11 years where we are now and uh you know we've seen we get to see everyone's dirty laundry it's pretty powerful it's pretty powerful yeah so when when you were talking about your paddling and your overuse issue are you on one side of the boat i'm not that familiar with the sports so are you paddling the one way most of the time well, or was it what's yeah what's interesting is you know I, I, I grew up kayaking in germany which is a dual sport but in a terrible position your, your upper spine is rounded your shoulders are forward right. every girl on the national team had shoulder surgery this, that's how sort of potentially compromising the, the boat is you're making then, you're uh, making such a strong case for people oh, to go know, into it's, these it's, water it's, sports here why serious. wouldn't you you got no money and guaranteed injuries this is no, no, it's, it's like standing in a cold shower <laughs> ripping up 20 dollar bills it's so good and uh my um you know so but on the national team, I paddled canoe, which was all one-sided. And, and I tell you, it's given me really interesting insights into uh, throwers, pitchers. You know, you punch dominantly, you box a certain way. Tennis we're, players, we're, whatever. You, you nail it. And what we're going to see is that, you know, we're always going to have sort of this unilateral problem that, uh, you know, in, in the big scheme, the really simplistic thing is of saying, hey, look, we're looking for asymmetries. Well, I've never met a person. If you're right-handed or drive a car with your right foot, you're asymmetrical. If you skateboard or snowboard, 
you got a left foot forward, boom, you're asymmetrical. And so, you know, that's going to create a host of problems, but we should know what they are. And now we do. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> I mean, the paddling, that's kind of like an extreme version, but as you're saying, all of us have it to a certain extent. So what is, what is exactly happening with you? So you're over strengthening one side in comparison to the other. So well, like, take us through what's going on in the body. You know, with well, you if, I tell you, let's let's take some of your own training. If we if we look at the tools you guys have selected on on it, right? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of clubs. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of kettlebell swinging, right? Mm -hmm. And there's things like ropes. And what's mm -hmm. interesting is most of what we're thinking is, you know, if we just said it was an issue of strengthening, then we're really negating sort of uh, that's a really simplistic view. Maybe that was popular in the '80s. Like that's that's sort of that level of thinking. What we're seeing is that you know you are a basically a neuromuscular mechanical system, and when you start to view your body that way as having this incredible software, but the rest of the body is just hardware. And mm -hmm. what we end up seeing is, sure, I can develop patterning in the brain that reinforces a certain way of doing things that gets lopsided in terms of motor control both sides. But what we're really seeing is that we start to see the connective tissue reflect the reality of the, of the movement, right? And that's the fascia starts to, starts to wind itself into a unilateral uh, lopsided web. We start to see all the joint capsules start to go that way. Sure, what you're seeing is, hey, we see one side that's really strong and one side that's it's got massive thick musculature, right? Because it's, right. it's supporting that. But um, what ends up happening then is all of those factors really start – causing basically what we when we look at mechanics around the body we look at the spine first because that gives us a, a, a way of thinking about what to prioritize first what to prioritize second and what we know is that when we prior when we sort of put your spine in a compromised position we dump a lot of force and we shut down a lot of your ability your body's ability to generate force from a sort of a neural output position and then also when you compromise your spinal position your body starts doing strange things with the musculature to try to protect itself and so what we've traditionally said was tight hamstrings for example is usually the body freaking out and trying to uh, protect the nervous system by making the hamstrings tight so mm -hmm. we can stretch those things for example but it doesn't really change anything until we undo the the mechanical dysfunction or the mechanical poor positioning around the spine, the bracing, the breathing. So one of the things that happens is that we can view the, the spine as sort of the limiting force output generator. And this is why we talk so much about head mechanics and, and everyone's obsessed. We're looking at lumbar, pelvis relationship. But then we can also view the spine as the primary engine chassis. And those primary engines are the hips and shoulders. So if you're disorganized at the trunk, then what we know is disorganized generating force or see decreased force at the shoulder and the hip. Yeah. And so literally now I have, well, a neural mechanical compromise and then I have a, a physical chassis body frame compromise. But then the other thing that I've become recently super obsessed with is that the, the, the frame of the trunk is really the, the breathing, like housing of your breathing system. So what ends up happening is that we see decreased mechanical ventilation efficiency, i.e., you breathe like crap, and when you're asymmetrical and twisted and have all these unilateral forces on the spine or twisted or your shoulders internally rotated, then you can't stabilize your neck, and now mm -hmm. you throw wrong or you punch wrong. Or, and so we start to see you know, problems, but more importantly, we see decreases in force production. So to tie this back into the tools that you guys have used, what's interesting is that you're forcing, especially with the kettlebell use and the, and the ropes, you're forcing – the body to figure out how to stabilize both sides yeah. and by getting off of the floor and getting off of a bar you're forcing I can't create what I call a fixed torque environment so off a barbell I can break the barbell and spread the barbell and create stability mm -hmm. but when I have dumbbells or kettlebells in my hand I have to create the stability back at the primary engine otherwise I'm gonna default And so it's interesting you guys have chosen a set of tools that really highlights the solution to so many of the problems that we're seeing yeah, that definitely makes a big difference. And especially if you, you know, you can still tweak things and, and get things out of whack. But as I've gotten a little bit older, too, I've become far more aware. I mean, there's natural tendencies that we all have. And it's not just one side dominance, too. There's 
you know, chest tightening that's rounding the shoulders forward. I mean, I don't know how many, maybe it's because everybody compared bench press when they were in high school. <laughs> like, I don't know, I don't know what the exact cause of it, but almost everybody has that, that rotation where their shoulders are pushing forward because no one's adequately stretching or doing any myofascial on their chest. Um, quad dominance over hamstrings, all of these things that you need to start to kind of, yeah, get in the muscle, start working strength, but also start working to release that fascia. Um, Super well, important. You're, you're really nailing it. What we want to do is create, you know, give athletes, this is Jupiter the Wonder Dog, by the way. Um, we want to give uh, athletes a systems approach. So, you know, moving better is the first solution. And that's why, you know, it's technique, it's position. And so what we're doing with when the gym really is saying, okay, do you understand what the position is? Good. We're going to challenge that. How? Well, I'm going to challenge your position by adding load or speed or cardiorespiratory demand or metabolic demand or, or competition, right? That's really what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't think people understand that, you know, our definition is that if you, the person who has sort of the mo most robust positioning mechanics under all those different variables is the fittest by definition and is the most stable. So, you know, we've got the movement pretty dialed. There are a lot of ways to train all of them will get to you to the Olympics. Some of them will get you to the Olympics faster, to the octagon victory faster. But what we have seen is that we have to give people a systems approach. It's not just muscle trigger points. It's not just soft tissue, but it also is joint capsule. And then because we're living in this modern age where we get to sort of run experiments at so much larger scale, we have really cultivated and developed best practices. You know, the way you guys are obsessed with you know, taking foods and, and giving those sort of, you know, nutraceutical aspects of food back into people. Mm -hmm. We've done this, tried to do the same thing with saying, hey, these are the mechanical restrictions on your position. Why can't you fix these? These should be ubiquitous and universal and democratic. Yeah. So anybody who's, you know, really serious about their athletic performance, you know, you, you got to you gotta pay attention to this. But even the people who aren't, and that's what I want to talk about now is people who aren't really competing and they're just trying to stay in shape. You know, what are some of the things that, that you can, you know, tell them? I mean, because a lot of us were on keyboards all day, right? So, oh. you know, the mouse, the mouse hand always takes a beating because that's somehow at least a couple inches higher than the other hand. I don't, I don't around. know what you're talking about, my mouse hand. Is this some <laughs> euphemism? For, uh, so, well, yeah. you know, what, I think what you're, you're nailing is that, um, you know, we're finally getting savvy to the fact that, hey, you can't just go to the gym or, you know, eat less sugar and then magically end up in the right right position you know that it's not it's not the solution and you know it's sort of that 28 you know 24 23 58 rule you know for, oh good you 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 smash your quads for 2 minutes what you do for the rest of the day right and um you know it's interesting if if we look at the trends of of coaching if we listen to the maxims of coaches we end up with really the, the language has been there all along. So, for example, you know, it's, they say position before submission. That's mm -hmm. like such an obvious one that everyone, if you follow fighting at all, that you understand. Well, that really is saying that, hey, you know, you have to be able to understand what the mechanics are, you know, and then be able to express those mechanics. Well, Musashi, what, 400 years ago, was like, hey, make your fighting stance your everyday stance. Like, there's no difference between who you are in the world and who you are when you're training or exercising. So if, if we're practicing, and the physiology is known to us about how the shoulder works. Why? Because we haven't really evolved in 10,000 years. And we've, as humans, we've been obsessed with lifting heavy weights. Like, for example, mm -hmm. the guy Thor, right, who plays the mountain on Game of Thrones, like I just walked right. five steps with, what, 1,400 pounds, 1,450 pounds, something like that. <laughs> but, yeah. but some dude did that 1,000 years ago. You know what I mean? Like we have been really, I mean, like the guy broke his back allegedly a thousand years ago and wasn't the same, but you get the idea. <laughs> well, that, it was close. I mean, it was close. I mean, a thousand years ago, a guy walked with 1,400 pound mass on his shoulders. My point is that we've been obsessed with being strong and fast and fighting for as long as we've been humans. But now we can sort of work this out. And what's happened is we're not identifying these environmental loads. You know, we want to get into, um, you know, like high performance, like you say in your little intro video, which is so good, hey, most of us can work at 80%. Mm -hmm. But the real issue is professionals can't work at 80%. Nope. And more importantly, why aren't you working at 100%? Because if you were kicking ass at 100%, 
you don't feel very much pain. You don't get, you don't get injured. You, you know what I mean? You, you function better. You're more lucid. And so we really want to take this slack out of the system and get beyond, hey, it's functional enough. And in physical therapy terms, when we say function, that means like you can get off the toilet, you can wipe your <laughs> butt, you can do your bra. Like that's not optimal. That's functional, right? right? And so when we start sort of flipping this around and looking at the environmental loads, are you sleeping? Yes or no? Like what are we even talking about, you know? Yeah. Um, are, are, do you have a soft tissue practice? Are you working on your positions every day? Are you trying to kind of cultivate? And more importantly, as you just described, what are you doing all day long that's wrecking your mechanics? So right now, you know, I got some big, big training to do today, but I'm squatting as I'm talking to you because I'm trying to open up my hips. I'm opening up my ankles. And what we're really seeing is that people are spending eight to 10 hours a day in a seated position. And the physiology is very clear. You can't cheat your physiology on that. And the mechanical adaptation to that, you just end up wondering why you can't put your arms over your head. And yet you spent eight hours, 14 hours a day sitting in a slouch position like you deserve it. You mentioned sleep real quick. And, and that's something that, uh, you know, has, has come up for me a lot because as I become more aware of my body and, and we have some great trainers here who are very much in line with your thinking and they've been enlightening me a lot. And I notice I'm a side sleeper, so I can feel now that when I'm sleeping on my side, my whole shoulder girdle is compressing and, and rounding as I do that. And I'm realizing that probably <coughs> I'm going to have to sleep, learn how to sleep on my back. Is that what you generally recommend? Because I know sleeping itself, that's another eight hours, you know, hopefully if you're lucky. Um, but it's eight hours stuck in a position that is going to also affect your body mechanics. Well, you know, what we, we're looking at is one is you're saying, I'm assuming you have normal rotation of your shoulders. If you don't have normal yeah. internal rotation of your shoulder, right, and that's to be able to, to be able to kind of bring your out, arm 90 and bring your hand down, then your shoulder mm -hmm. kicks forward, which is exactly the position you're sleeping in, in a compensated position. So if you don't have internal rotation, then when you end up on your side – with this hand across your body, the third hand, you know, what, whose hand is that? <laughs> and what ends up happening is that the shoulder ends up cranking forward. And yes, that is a crappy position to spend any time in. And more importantly, what's it do to your neck position? Yeah, totally. See, the, the neck ends up falling. So what we really are saying is, hey, look, let's just say that we are very clear about what baseline should be on humans. This isn't extra normal. This isn't gymnastics level stuff. There was, a, you know, Rogan put out a great uh, – Instagram photo of him working on his middle splits, right? And he's got a pile, he just finished training, pile of sweat on the mat. He's working on his middle splits, feet are up. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, that's the way we need to be thinking about positioning. You've got to do it and be obsessed with it. Muscles and tissues are like obedient dogs. And if you're missing these mechanics, then they're going to stalk you everywhere, even in your sleeping position. So if, if you're missing internal rotation on your back, for example, your shoulders come up. You wake up and your hands go to sleep and look at your neck. It all collapses down. Mm -hmm. So what we, what we can say is, well, let's take all the principles that we've learned around movement and things we give a crap about and let's apply it to things we shouldn't have to give a crap about like our sleeping position. If neutral spine is neutral spine and that's the best organization, then how much pillow do I need? I need enough pillow to fit this position so that my head stays neutral, right? Right. So if I collapse down or I collapse back, then – you don't have enough pillow. So I don't really, it doesn't really care. You know, we don't care what type of pillow you're on, just that your neck is basically in the same position it is when you're sitting or standing. And then make sure you have a normal range of motion. If you're putting your arms over your head to sleep and you don't have full range of motion, you're going to compensate to do some strange things. You mm -hmm. sleep in some really, really crazy positions. Our idea is, man, everything is basically a diagnostic tool. You can figure out a lot about your positions based on what you're, you know, the, the cheating shapes that you're in all the time or the compensation shapes. And, you know, sleeping is just a position. It's no magical or less magical than, you know, uh, you know running. And, yeah. you know, the one thing that we do advocate for people is how I think we've been sleeping on beds that are way too hard given the modern age of sitting. I think we probably need to be a little bit more like a hammock. You know, and I know, you know, this is like politics for people, you know, but uh, you know, I think a little bit softer, that really takes the extension load out of our spines, lets us sleep in a little bit of flexion, that, that's been useful. Um, you know, but we're just talking about sleeping position, we're not talking about how tight, cold the room should be, is it dark, do, are you bringing your phone into the room, what the hell are you doing, you know what I mean, do you, like, people are, the room isn't black, 
Like there's just a lot of low hanging fruit that we can take. And then if you're actually getting good quality sleep, then we can start talking about what you should eat for breakfast, you know? Yeah. So sleep is definitely that important foundation where everything is kind of built off of for the day, you know? Oh, well, I'll tell you what, here, here's what's interesting. You know, I'm training for the world championships and outrigger canoeing um, in Molokai. And it's been a while since I've had a big, big, scary race hanging over my head. And it's been a while since I've had to live off of a spreadsheet, right, get good coaching. And I have brutal numbers I got to hit five days a week training for this five to seven hour race. And what I can tell you now is once again as a coach, and I was just talking to uh, the head of performance for the Eagles, and he says the same thing, you know, that like, boy, when you're focused again on having a goal or having to meet work outputs, you realize, again, why you hammer everyone on hydration, why you hammer everyone on nutrition, why you've got to be on the sleep, why the movement mechanics have to be improved because the, the higher outputs make the speed wobbles really, really obvious. And the yeah. problem for most of us is that we're not exposing ourselves to intensities or positions that expose the speed wobble. But that speed wobble is, I can see it in your deadlift. I can see it in your squat. I can see it when you're battle rope. You know, you're, you're doing double ropes, and every time you come down, you know, your, your lower back is rounding. That's a diagnostic tool. So we want people to understand that, you know, you, we have really worked out the details here because of the Internet, because all these amazing coaches are talking to each other, and that means that we've got to apply those lessons, and we are. It's been incredible. People are, people are way smarter than we give them credit for. Mm -hmm. So if someone's listening to this right now and they're like, man, I got to get on this program. I got to check it out. Um, you know, how are you able to, you know, are there just universal principles? You know, how are you able to coach people remotely in these things? Are there just kind of basics that everybody needs to do or are there ways that they can do kind of like a self-diagnostic? Well, you know, you bring up an interesting point. You know, right now I'm sort of in the battle of, you know, physical therapy. I'm a physical therapist, but that's classically trained. But, you know, what we can't do is put a physio or a chiro or an osteo between you and starting to understand how your body works. You know, we should have a basic understanding of what the principles that govern your bias mechanics. So CrossFit is a methodology. Strong First is a methodology. You know, I mean, all of these are methodologies, but we mm -hmm. can't ignore the principles. And what the reason we can get to the heart of the matter in so many sports is that the spine is the spine, the shoulder is the shoulder. It hasn't changed. And good shapes are good shapes. And what you'll see is that once you understand the principle, you're under, starting to understand what positions or what, what people have been working towards in terms of technique. And so the very first thing to do is just hit the low, low hanging fruit, like hit the easy things. You know, if people understood that none of your tissues should hurt to compression. So if I take a, even a, a, a baseball, a golf ball, a cross ball, I don't have to spend any money. Go like walk up and down the street in front of a kid's house, steal that ball on the, in the <laughs> sidewalk. I mean, like get started, put it on your quads, lay on your stomach, and a couple of things are going to happen. One is you're going to f find that it's very painful. And automatically, if it's painful at all to compression, it's not normal. Mm -hmm. That's a, that should be just like people should be like, what the hell? Are you serious? Put it in your lats. Put it on the back of your shoulder. Put it in your pecs. Put it on your glutes. What you're going to find is you're like, oh, my God, I'm a tack down myofascial mess. Mm -hmm. Second thing is that if you stop breathing, that's a problem. And not only because what you're going to see is that these tissue restrictions that we have – we basically create stability and we don't go all the way in and all the way out in terms of our breathing because it's painful. So if I, if I you know, have you lay on a kettlebell handle and we, we smash in your guts, right? This, well, it's one of the ways that we trick the down regulation on folks. What ends up happening is they, they're like, I can breathe. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck is that? That's not breathing. Like I'm going to put That's you panting. under amazing loads yeah. as human beings, as a fighter, as an athlete, as a runner. I need you to have be able to breathe all the way in and all the way out. And if we take the Gemini, our little tool, on your T-spine, I load you up, hold a plate on your chest, roll back and forth, or a couple of cross balls on your spine, you've got to breathe all the way in and all the way out, and it's not supposed to hurt or feel like beef jerky, and now it's clear. Check, mm -hmm. move on to something else. So what we're advocating for is you've got to sort of start experimenting. And, you know, the heart of this, this human movement, this revolution in performance, is that we are all – an N of one. You are the best diagnostician. You know what works for you and what doesn't work for you. You know, everything should be observable, measurable, repeatable. If you can't see change, you didn't make change. If you don't experience change, 
there's no change. And so I think what's amazing is, you know, take any product. Like, you know, if you put too much MCT oil in your coffee, you get diarrhea. That's mm-hmm. probably too much, right? If you add some MCT oil and feel like a kick-ass person, boy, that's an experiment of one. But you can also go further now. You can get a blood test and see how getting rid of the crappy fats and putting good fats in affects you. And so what I'm saying is, Let's do the same thing with our maintenance. Do your positions get better? Does your mechanical efficiency get better? Mm-hmm. Right? If you're if you're a Ferrari and your handbrakes are on, this is a good example. So GSP, you know, came out and did some camp with us. We've been work with him. He's such a good athlete and such a good student. But uh, I was showing him he was basically missing some internal rotation and also missing some internal rotation in his hip and extension. And what that was doing is, you know, when he fought Hendricks, he hit him hard a couple times and didn't knock him out. And George was like, I don't understand. I hit him hard. And I was like, well, let me show you how this lack of position is basically causing his power. And when we showed him that, his mind exploded. Because imagine taking one of the best athletes in the world and being like, here's another 15% right. that, you've, that you've just blown off. Now let's take that concept and apply it to everyone. Holy crap. I mean, we just don't even know what the top end is yet. Well, for for a lot of people, maybe GSP it's fifteen percent. For for a lot of people, we're losing forty percent efficiency. Oh, you know, seriously, seriously. And imagine, I mean, and this is where I think we've got to we got to cast a little bit bigger net. You know, this is who cares if you're the best in the world? Are you the best for you? Yeah. Are you at your optimum? Yes or no? And so what you know, when we compare, like I I have so many friends who have Olympic medals and they can sneak a cigarette and eat a little chocolate donut, it doesn't matter, <laughs> because they're genetic monsters, right? And they just happen to be better than everyone else, mm-hmm. right? But what we got to also look at is, you know, you, you're going to come out, you got to come out unharmed if you can. I mean, the NFL, it's hard to come out unharmed. The octagon, it's hard to come out unharmed. But there are a lot of sports that are not contact sports. You should come out unharmed. You should not run yourself into a new hip. That means that there was a problem in the mechanics. Does that sure. make sense? Sure, totally. And and if a we, lot of people wake themselves up harmed, you know, they'll move a box and get harmed, you know, and, and a lot of these things. These are signs and signals that your body is overprotecting for some deficiency in your movement well, pattern or in your muscle dude, structure. Yes, and the problem is we haven't empowered people to understanding. You know, how do we know we typically have a problem? It hurts. You know, that's that's the first thing that punches through my brain. But but check this out. And I've talked about this before, but you know. If movement and pain are the same pathways in the brainstem, and so if you're moving, you actually can't hear the, the pain signal. If you stop moving and lay, lay down at night, your body starts throbbing. You're like, oh my God, this bed is killing my shoulder. I'm like, it's not the bed. It's moving, and the only input you're getting now is your brain. So we have a movement problem that blocks pain signals. That's actually a very useful human adaptation, right? Most of us have learned to be able to downregulate pain signals because you're an athlete. That's why we train. It's always uncomfortable. It always hurts. But if you've ever been in a competition or a fight, how much pain do you feel at the time? Zero. That is the dirty secret of fighting, <laughs> man. Yeah. Adrenaline goes up. I mean, afterwards, you feel like crap, right? You may have gotten knocked out, but it still doesn't <laughs> yeah. hurt. But what the point is that once the adrenaline is going, right, norepinephrine is on, plus I'm moving, plus I'm, I've practiced this. I can't wait around for pain to tell me I have a problem with my position or mechanics. Yeah. What we've got to do is flip the thing forward. I can't tell you how many people were like, I'm like, what happened to your knee? And they're like, I don't know. I just woke up and it was like that. I'm like, you just woke up and your knee was like a basketball? Oh. Like, you just don't even know what happened? No, I just woke up. I'm like, dude. And the issue is that we've done a whole bunch of damage that has some latency and effect. I mean, that's like printing widgets out of a machine. And every machine, every time one comes out broken, we're like, oh, it's broken. Then yeah. we go back to why it's broken versus saying, hey, do you understand the quality of your positions and quality of your tissues? Yes or no. That gets us miles of head before we break because we are amazing designs and we can handle a bunch of bad positions until it blows up on our face. And that's the crucial aspect. We can't confuse the genetic bounty that is the human body for the fact that, boy, there are right ways and more right ways to do things than the other way. So one of the one of the tips that I've used that has been incredibly beneficial, and this is not a recommendation, I'm just talking personal experience. If I eat a little bit of high quality marijuana edibles and then I grab a lacrosse ball, I can spend about two hours figuring shit out within my body. And that for me was like that moment when I did that for the first time was like a real awakening. Cause I oh, could actually I could it. I could feel and hear 
like the fibers releasing. I could track different things. I could see how things were related. And I was in there like sweating and it was like two and a half hours, but it was probably one of the most, it was like a religious experience when I finished that. I was like, I I've, I've been to the mountain. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen the light. You know, I came back with the holy tablets. I don't, but that was, that was a pretty amazing experience for me. And, you know, being able to tap into your body in that kind of, with that kind of x-ray vision, um, really changed a lot of things. I mean, still to that now, since that, you know, I pull my, I pull my chin back, you know, as often as I can, I rotate my pelvis, you know, cause I could feel that that was off. I dropped my shoulders off my neck. A lot of these things that I was able to notice and see happening, you know, but it all started with that diagnostic. And I think that's a, a key point of what you mentioned. Like you got to be your own you know, you got to be your own car mechanic. You got to check yourself into the garage, totally. run the oil change, run everything, figure well, it out. What's interesting, besides the edible time traveling that you just did, <laughs> is um, if we really look at the underpinning of that, and if you're, if people aren't, you know, the people listening should understand that in professional sports, I know a lot of athletes that the only way they can downregulate is to ingest a consumable smoke marijuana. And what's happened is that because we spend all our time going from zero to 60, how fast can you drink this amped six fuel octane <laughs> to charge rip, rah, right? right? Fire your adrenals, go cup of fear. And, um, <laughs> what ends up happening is I'm like, that's great. You've gone from zero to 60. Show me how you're bringing yourself back down again. You know, you've, you're on the you're on the phone until eleven o'clock at night. Serotonin is lighting up, pew pew pew, right? You're drinking seventeen bulletproof <laughs> gallons of coffee, yeah. and all of a sudden, it's time to go to sleep, or it's time to flip on your parasympathetic down regulatory nervous system, and you have zero strategies for that. And so, what we've seen is that in the 1950s on, I mean, the the cocktail hour was about that. People having yeah. a nightcap was a way of self medicating. And alcohol turns out to be a, not a very good way to self-medicate in terms of down-regulating, but people feel like they relax. Sure. Marijuana use is the same thing. We see that it basically starts this down-regulatory cascade. I, you know, what we need people to understand, though, is understand what the mechanism behind that is. What you did when you had that experience was that you basically tricked your nervous system into down-regulation. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons we've got to teach people how to do the diaphragmatic breathing and breathing as they mobilize is that that deep breathing is my body's way of saying everything's cool here, bro. There's no, you know, nothing is fucked here. Yeah. And what ends up happening is if you hold your breath, you drop or you're breathing up in your chest because you don't have a good breathing pattern, then you end up in this sympathetic fight or flight. You is it can't working? hold back the magic. It's flowing again. <laughs> it's back so, again. You were talking about diaphragmatic breathing when we left off. And more importantly, we're talking about down regulation. Mm -hmm. Can you turn your body off and brain off. And so what we see is that people have zero, like for example, you cannot watch TV to downregulate. That is That just actually keeps your mind going even though your body chills out, it's bad for you. Cold water immersion, boom, reset that button. Um, you know, meditating, getting in a dark room, starting to cue all your signals. We find that some gut smashing, if you lay on a ball and smash out your guts, that has this response, this, this somatovisceral response that tells your brain, chill out. And for, for all our soldiers, all our fighters, everyone who's like, well, it's life and you know, fight or flight every day, then one of the things that we see is that they cannot turn off. Cortisol starts to go up, you know, it starts to flip, all their biomarkers start to go whack. And you know, they they we're seeing that people cannot downregulate. And one of the things that we're just obsessed with is you have to be able to go from zero to 60 and from 60 to zero. And what you experienced was being able to turn on that switch so that mm -hmm. you could actually access your One of the reasons that we make sure that people can breathe is that if you're holding your breath and rolling on a ball or doing myofascial stuff, then what you're doing is you're not letting your body chill out and you're going to resist that and you don't have the same effects. I mean, you just like, you stumbled on one of the most important things. One of the reasons I save all the soft tissue work for after training is that it causes my body to chill out. It brings me back down. Go after the joints. Get yourself prepped, right, in terms of position mechanics. Get hot and sweaty, but then do all your soft tissue work afterwards. Interesting. There's a bunch of stuff I want to talk to you about from what you just said. But So, so this tip is, you know, you see a lot of people, and I've, I do it as well, do some kind of light rolling out prior to a workout. 
Um, and sometimes, you know, you get in there a little bit, but you're recommending that you do more of like that active warm up, joint preparation, movement prep, and then do your myofascial, your, your kind of, your rolling out after the workout. Yeah. You know, if you've ever had a massage, you stand up and you feel like you're groggy and sleepy and your yeah, voice yeah, yeah. is lower. That's your body telling you, dude, you just down regulated. That's that, you know, Zen state. And we found that if we save the soft tissue work for afterwards, and don't get me wrong, if, you, if you're warning, warming up and there's something that's super gristly and won't let go, mm-hmm. go attack it, right? Yeah, because right. It's, it's so fibrotic or stiff that it's not going. But you, it's not a good use of your time, I think, to just do some really cursory rolling. I just, you know, what I'd rather you do is spend much more time getting hot and sweaty and working on your position mechanics. Do that dynamic warm up. You know, get, you know, this kills me. People are coming in like ready to lift heavy or ready to fight or ready to do something and then they lay on the ground and roll around. I mean like that that doesn't look like what we're about to do and it certainly <laughs> is not what you're about to do before you go skiing sure. Sure. or you know before you do some other sports. So, you know, what I would say is, you know, the best practice is it's not an accident that the yogis did sun salutation. That was about breathing, about getting hot, about touching all the corners, right? Pavel wrote what like super joints like 30 years ago or something, and he basically was saying, get up and move your joints through every range of motion they can do, touch the corners, sweep off the snow, get things sliding a little bit, then when you go to train, you're all set, then do some soft tissue work when you get down, but we've taken the myofascial stuff, and we put it in front of the actual movement, and it's the movement stuff that we need to be obsessed about first, but then since we just ran a diagnostic tool, I can then change that after I train, and that's the crucial aspect. Yeah. Awesome. I think that's an awesome tip. And then I also want to talk to you about, you know, some of those techniques for, for down regulating. One of them you mentioned was, well, first of all, gut smashing. Let's, let's cover that one. Cause not a lot of people have heard of that. Not a lot of people understand that. And I imagine that as you talked about doing it over a kettlebell handle, that sounds rather unpleasant, but I imagine you could do the same thing with like a, like a hard medicine ball or a basketball yes. or something like that. So just kind of put it on your guts and, and relax and focus on your breathing, right? Well, that's a, that's a first start, right? Because this is very low tech. Are you going to pop a kidney or just, no, no, no. <laughs> like it's impossible. What's interesting is that when I ask people, and especially athletes, okay, let, let's take you for example. Um, how many times have your quads been sore? Uh, I don't know. I can't count that high. <laughs> a billion times, <laughs> a billion right? Time. But what'd you do? You got a massage, you smash them, you mobilize, right? Sure. There's all those things, right? Sure. Okay. How many times have your abs been sore? I mean, less than my quads, but I've gotten them sore, you know, quite a few like, times. Okay, just think about how much you're using basically for everything. Now, think about how many times you've worked on the quality of the soft tissue and the musculature of your trunk. How much rolling have you done in your trunk? I've almost done zero rolling, but I did have these, you know, we have these guys that get into my psoas and it's like, it's like they're reaching in and massaging my soul. I don't even understand what's going on in there. Okay, so let's just look at this as a mechanical system. Let's de, de like mystify the fact that you have some guts in there, right? Yeah. And let's just look at the trunk as a muscular connective tissue sheath. And what's happened is that sheath is so tacked down and so stiff and full, so full of trigger points that if you put any pressure in there, which you've never done basically ever, and you're, you're ahead of the game, most mm-hmm. people are like, don't touch my stomach. I just don't like it, right? <laughs> don't touch it. I don't know don't what it is. Don't touch my belly. It's my belly. And, um, you know, there's, there's this old saying that's like God would think he was a, you know, man would think he was a God if except for his belly, right? And I right. think they were talking about all you have to do is get diarrhea or food poisoning and you realize that you're just mortal. Right. But I take that a step further and says, you know, this trunk is the limiting factor to all my things I do. And most people have never worked on, you know, beautiful six pack abs. And by the way, they don't work for shit. They don't slide, they're stiff. Like they can't even extend. Want to know the reason why we see so many sports hernias in the world? That's the reason. The entire system is under so much stiffness, compression, tackness that ends up tearing at where those tissues come into the pelvis. And so one of the things that we can see is that we're losing efficiency in rotation force and stabilizing force in the mechanical breathing and my capacity to stabilize the whole thing. So if you just go to Walmart, Walgreens, get yourself a $2 princess ball, right? <laughs> Seriously, take your shirt off in the privacy of your own home and start smashing the fuck out of your stomach. And that literally, remember, it shouldn't hurt and you've got to take a big breath in and a big breath all the way out. 
twist on your stomach. Imagine grabbing it and twisting all the skin and then shear across. Get up into your diaphragm, underneath your, underneath your ribcage. Your diaphragm is like one of the hardest working muscles in the whole system, 10, 20,000 breaths a day. You know, that thing is just like, that's skirt steak. That's what that is. It's a skirt steak. And we, you can change the effectiveness of your diaphragm by getting up on, with a softball underneath your rib cage. What you're going to freak out about is, A, how much performance you've lost. Think about your VO2 max, which we obsess about, right? It's interesting that all of the tools on your website, we can build strength and control, but they're really about conditioning because mm -hmm. what we're seeing is conditioning wins all the time, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you can't. it's important that you're a powerful athlete. But we value the conditioning above almost every other thing. Yeah. And if we're just looking at your VO2 <clears throat> capacity, if I improve your ability to be able to expand and contract your rib cage and go after your guts, boy, everything works. Plus, if you just do some gut smash at night, you're going to fall asleep. Like, it's amazing what happens. And that's, dude, that's a $2 fix to a huge problem. Very, very cool advice. Um, Cold exposure, another great thing, another hack that I've <clears throat> been using a lot. You know, I'll get a get a hot bath and then set the shower on as cold as it'll go and then go back into that. Amazing how that allows you to just kind of release a lot of tension from the day, uh, especially I sometimes will do multiple cycles of that. And at the end of that, you know, you can do it in a spa. Obviously, they've been doing that for hundreds of years with the cold plunge and the, and the hot, that kind of hot and cold. Amazing. The breathing, as you said, attached to meditation. Flotation tanks. Oh. Another amazing way to, to downregulate. I mean, all so, of these things are just my, as my, important. My uh, thanks to Joe, my wife and I. Uh, there's a we, there's a great place up in like this hippie section of Marin called Fairfax, uh -huh. and we go there in the dark, and it's it's awesome. I mean, it's so awesome. Yeah. And um, I, someone put up on like a Kickstarter. They're like, it's a home like flotation device yeah. unit you know like a float and, tent i think it's called. yes yeah the float tent my wife i was like dude we're getting this my wife's like well where are you gonna put it <laughs> that's what that that conversation has happened ten thousand times i think that's i'm like you, you don't is. understand i need this and she's like oh i understand it's going on the roof if you want to live on the roof in your float tent you go right ahead and do it it's unbelievable how many times i've heard that the guys are like we got to get this and the girl's like uh-huh. And where are you going to put it? <laughs> <laughs> so, sounds hilarious. great, hon. Yeah. You, you, you can do it. So my wife has totally figured out that, um, you know, if I, get, if I get a bee in my bonnet about something, if, if, she, if she fights me on it, then it just like the barb just sets a little deeper. It sets yeah. a little deeper. I become more obsessed. And so she's literally like, go ahead. You can put it on the roof. And I'm like, yeah, it's kind of a stupid idea. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. <laughs> is, that, is that a powerful San Pedro cactus there behind you on the other oh, side? Oh, uh, you know, it may be. <laughs> I like the little, little throwback to the Wachuma era. I appreciate that. There you go. That, there you sure. go. Well, you know, it's part of our mid-century modern uh, vibe here, uh -huh. you know. And, like uh, you know, the Heath tile, the, uh, you know, this, this is what we do, uh -huh. you know. I like it, man. I like it. I got a little garden outside and back, you know. Appreciate that. Well, Kelly, this has been a wealth of information, and it's been awesome to, to talk to you. Hopefully, if you come through Austin, please come by. Check out our spot. I'd love to shake your hand and, and hang out for a little bit. Well, we're, we're huge fans, and, and – uh, you know, putting food back into people is revolutionary. Helping people sleep, helping people, you know, function better, get through the cloud. I mean, we're, we're really huge fans of what you guys are doing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's no bullshit, you know? Yeah, right on, man. Agreed. Likewise, same to you. So people can follow you at Mobility Wad everywhere. Mobility Wad. If you put in Mobility Wad and you don't find Kelly, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> something, something's up, but, uh, but pretty much everywhere. Anything else that you want to kind of point people to? No, I, I guess just as you guys say, people have no idea how much better they can function, how much better they can feel. And it's like, you know, the problem with the human being is that we're so good at normalizing suffering. You can just set this, this ground state. Let me give you an example. There's a guy up the street. His kid plays with my kid. They're such an amazing family. He's been smoking since he was 10 years old mm -hmm. and he just quit smoking. And uh, he's in like day nine or 10. And he's like, Kelly, I had no idea how crappy I felt all the time. And I'm like, weird, huh? You've been feeling that way since you were 10, bro. Wow. You, you can do better. And, uh, and, and if you're not doing better, it's because you're not paying attention because there's so many people talking about it. It's crazy. Amen to that, brother. Amen. All right, man. Um, thank you. And I uh, look forward to talking and hanging sometime in the future, my friend. True fact. Thanks, guys. All right. Take care, Kelly.